this. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for what we read in these verses 18 to 23. And Lord, how they reveal for us the wrath of God upon mankind because of what they do and, and seeing creation and, and choosing to reject it. So Lord, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought, Lord, that you're, you would anoint my lips with the preaching and teaching of your word. So Lord, I pray that we would hear from you and not from my notes. Lord, that it would be your word that goes forth in power and clarity. Lord, that you would take our opinions, our ideas, and our thoughts and bring them in submission to the authority of your word. We ask all this in the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so you're in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. I'm going to encourage you to grab a piece of paper and a pen. We're going to look at a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of verses. And because we're looking at a lot of verses, and I love you, we're going to put some of those verses up on the wall for you, right? So we don't have to flip to them. We're going to look at a couple verses, but some of them are going to be up on the screen for you. But here's what I want you to do. You're in verse 18. I want you to back up to verse 14 because... We need to understand what's motivating um, Paul when he's writing these words. So as he's writing these words, he says in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed. And it's easy for us to just kind of pick out these verses and kind of remove them from the context of the scriptures. And we would be missing a whole lot. We'd be missing a bunch of stuff. And so it's wise for us to go back and kind of get the flow, the context. Why is Paul talking about the wrath of God? It's because he's talking about the righteousness of God. Well, why is he talking about the righteousness of God? Because he's talking about the gospel of God. Well, why is he talking about the gospel of God? It's because he's talking about lost people that need Jesus. All right, so verse 14. Verse 14 says, I am debtor both to the Greeks... And to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Paul wants to have fruit in Rome. And so here's how we know this. In verse 14, he believes that he owes them the gospel. This is what motivates him to share the gospel. Let me ask you, what motivates you to share the gospel? Let's talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What motivates you to share the gospel? Number one for him is he thinks he, 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 he has, he's under the opinion that he owes the loss of the gospel, that he has something that they don't have, and he owes it to them. So that's what he says in verse 14. Verse 15, he says, So as much as is in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. Here's a second reason why he wants to go to Rome to preach the gospel, because he's prepared himself to do so. We live in a day and age where people go to Bible study after Bible study, get equipping after equipping, and they do nothing with the tool that they've been given. They do nothing with the tool that they've equipped themselves with. And so he says, hey, I'm ready to preach the gospel. In Rome. And then verse 16, very popular verse. We looked at this last week. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says, I'm willing to go to Rome and I'm not ashamed. I'm, a, I'm not afraid to preach it before kings. I'm not afraid to preach it on the street. I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel of God. What a statement that is. And I shared last week just how it's easy to say those things and not necessarily mean them. Paul means them. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And what we find is eventually in, Rome, in Acts chapter 28, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be brought to Rome. He's going to preach the gospel. And he's going to lose his head for Christ. And yet he's able to say, I'm not ashamed. And then he gets to verse 17. He says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. So he wants to go to Rome. Why? Because he wants to walk by faith so that others might walk by faith. He wants to see the faith, that his faith is now going to be passed on to somebody else. By faith, by faith, right? So he says, for, the right, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so he desperately wants to get to Rome because he wants to see people get saved. But here's really why, verse 18. This is where we pick it up today. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed. 
from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, what in the world is he talking about? He says, verse 19 says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. God has revealed his truth. God has made known his truth. So here's the, here's the overarching theme I want you to have today. So I'm just going to encourage you to write this thing down. God gives all mankind access to the truth. That's the, that's the underlying theme of the entire message, that God gives all mankind. How much of mankind? All mankind access to the truth. Doesn't matter where you go, who you talk to, every person on this planet has come face to face with the reality that God exists. That's what verses 18 and 19 tell, tell us. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Listen, God wants us to know Him. You agree with that? God wants us to know Him. That's why he gives us a witness. Now, here's what's amazing about God. Here's what's amazing about this book. So he gives us two witnesses, really, uh, separate from God. So he gives you creation. And we're going to read about that here in chapter 1. But he also gives us conscience. And we're going to read about that in chapter 2. That if you didn't even have the Bible, and you look at creation, and you, and you have this internal um, right and wrong inside of you, just those two witnesses alone let you know that God exists. Just those two witnesses alone. And that's what God is laying out for us here in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 um, to 23. And so that God wants us to know Him. He reveals Himself through His creation and also the conscience. Now we'll get to that when we finally make it to chapter 2 next year, it seems like. It's going to take us a minute uh, to get there. But it's going to take us a while, but we'll get there. When we get to chapter 2, we'll talk about how God deals deals with our conscience. But what I want you to see here in verse 18... He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Look at this. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The word is the word hold. It's not suppress. It's not holding down. That's not what the word is. The word is hold, and he uses it for a reason. It's not that they're taking the truth and holding it down. They're not suppressing it. They're not pushing it down. No, no, no. He says, the, the wrath of God is revealed against, from heaven against all, um, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It's because they hold the truth in unrighteousness. It's because they recognize truth. They have it in their possession. They see it. They, they hold on to truth. At the same time, they hold on to their unrighteousness. They say, yes, I see who God is, but I see my sin, and I see who I am, and I'm going to choose this over this. So they're not suppressing truth. No, they're holding truth in unrighteousness. That's the point. It's not suppressing it. It's not holding it down. No, no. It's holding it while holding on to my sin, while holding on to, to my flesh, while, while holding on to, to, to my desires instead of God's desires. And so God says, fine, then that's revealing the wrath of God. Now, I'm just trying to paint a big picture here. So that's what makes them ungodly. That's what makes them uh, un- unrighteous. That's, it's because they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, look at verse 17. He says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. You see that in verse 17? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. What does that mean? Well, it's when people come to faith in the truth. It reveals the righteousness of God. Then you get to verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It's when people reject the truth that the wrath of God is revealed. So the righteousness of God is revealed when you believe the truth in faith. And the wrath of God is revealed in your life if you reject the truth of God in your own faith. Dangerous place to be. Rejecting the truth of God always reveals the wrath of God. Now, I want you to see John chapter 3 and verse 36. It's right up here. John chapter 3 and verse 36. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, a whole lot of stuff happened in this verse. You've got to grab it. He says, he that believeth on the Son, present tense, hath everlasting life. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you believe on Him. You called upon Him to save your soul because of what He did in His death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible says you have everlasting life in your possession right now. You don't get it the moment you die. No, you get it the moment you cry out to Him and ask Him to save your soul. So that's something you have, present tense, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today. You have it. That's amazing. However, the majority of this planet doesn't have it. 
He that believeth not the Son of God, sorry, the Son, shall not see life. What do they get to see? Eternal death. Why? For the wrath of God abideth on him. Do you see what the Bible just said? The wrath of God abideth. It means it abides, present tense. So you present tense have everlasting life inside of you. The lost world, they have the wrath of God abiding on them, present tense. Now, there was a preacher a long time ago, and I don't remember what his name is. But it was a long time ago, 1700s, 1800s. He said, I try to visualize everybody with an L on their forehead, not because they're losers, but because they're lost. He just tried everybody he came in contact with. He just wanted to assume that they did not know Christ. And a great, great way to go through life. You know, if you just visualize everybody's lost, they need saved. You can't take the gospel to the wrong address, right? I would just amend that and say, okay, no, I, I, I want a picture that everybody has the wrath of God abiding on them. Because that's what Scripture teaches. They're not just lost. Because they're lost, they have the wrath of God abiding on them. Would that not change the way you interact with people? Because can I just be flat out honest with you? There's some people I don't like. Can't stand to be around them. Don't like kicking it with them. Don't want to be in their presence. Well, what kind of a pastor am I? A human one. Right? They drive me nuts because of how they talk, what they do, what they're shooting up. You name it. I just don't want to be around it. But if I viewed them with the wrath of God abiding on them, would that not change the way I interacted with them? It would change everything about how I cared for them. It would change everything about the way that I, that I spoke with them, how I, how I talked with them, what I shared with them. Instead of me avoiding them in Walmart, I would go to them and try to have a conversation with them. If I'm avoiding you in Walmart, it's not because I don't like you. It's because I don't like Walmart. I don't like that place. But listen, listen, lost people are going to do what lost people are going to do. Because they don't know Christ. Can now just imagine this, that you recognize the truth of who God is. And lost people are going to recognize who God is and yet still hold that in their unrighteousness. Would that not do some wicked things in your heart? It would produce a lot of wickedness. And so I'm not surprised when wicked, wicked people do wicked things. I'm not surprised by it. I don't shake my head and just go, I wonder where we are. We live in a fallen world. But it's my responsibility, it's your responsibility to take the gospel to those who have the wrath of God abiding on them. Who do you know today? In your family, your friends, your ball team, your co-workers, that's their state today. The wrath of God is abiding on them. Maybe that's you today. You have the wrath of God abiding on you today because you're holding the truth in unrighteousness. Now let's understand what the wrath of God is. Check out Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 to 15. It's right here. And I know it's small. Let me read it to you, Ron. Your eyes can't read it. It's all right. It's okay. I got you. This is the second coming of Christ. This is when Jesus Christ comes back to this planet to make everything right. This is what the world will tell you they're wanting. If God's really God, then why didn't he come and fix it? He is coming and fixing it. And that means he's got to come to your house when he does it. If you're lost. Now he says, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Remember that. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Hey, dear believer, that's you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that is you. You get to be clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You get a horse. I don't like horses. You will then. You will then. Verse 15, and out of his mouth go with a sharp sword, and that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now check this out. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. But God's love. God would never pour out his wrath. No, because God is love, because God is just, he must pour out his wrath. 
But He will only pour out His wrath upon those who are holding the truth in unrighteousness. He will only pour out His wrath upon those who have rejected the truth. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you get to come with Him. That's pretty amazing. But notice how he ends it. He says, he treaded the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Now, this is something I've always wanted to do, and I want to do it. So they, they have these wine presses, and they fill them with grapes, and then you get to jump in the, in the press with them. And you know what you do? <laughs> Squeezing the blood of the grape. That's what Scripture calls it, the blood of the grape. So it pours out, and they, they have grape juice, and they'll ferment into wine. Every time you study the wine press in Scripture, it's always dealing with the wrath of God. That you can't escape it. You'll be tread, and the juice goes everywhere, and it stains the garment. He's going to have a garment dipped in blood. His vesture is going to be dipped in blood. This is the wrath of God. You do not want to be on the planet when God brings forth His wrath. Because he's coming to your house. He will deal with you. If you keep reading, then once, the, once everybody's been killed and once everybody's there and the blood is, is lying there and the, and the blood is risen to the bridle of the horse, he says the, the fowls of the air, the eagles come and they devour the flesh of kings. And the, 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 they devour the flesh of those that are dead. Where at the beginning of chapter 19, you are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. At the end of chapter 19, you are supper. That's called the supper of the great God. This is the wrath of God. Look at chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. It's talking about the great white throne judgment. It says that I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according, what does it say? To their works. But wait a second, doesn't Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 tell us that we're not saved by works? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast? You're right. But these people are being judged because they refused to trust in the finished work of Christ. And they said, nah, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to do it by my own works. And God says, fine, you want to do it on your own? I'll judge you by your works. And every person that will come to this judgment will be found guilty. Without fail. You will be found guilty if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You will come to this day and you will be found guilty. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And look at this, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. If, if I were you, I'd write that reference down as Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. This is what he's talking about. He's not talking about you breathing your last breath. He's talking about you dying for eternity. You shall not see life, according to John chapter 3 and verse 36. Verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's intense. Jesus says it's where your worm dieth not. That you can't escape the pain. You can't escape the heat. Forever. That's a long time. Does that not change the way you view the lost? Does that not change the way you view your, you view your lost mom? Because I got a mom that doesn't know Christ. And if she doesn't get saved, there will be no rejoicing at her funeral. I got to go to a funeral where there was rejoicing this week. There won't be rejoicing at her funeral because she does not know Christ and she rejects it. And so, Mom, if you listen to this message, please get saved. Come to know Christ as your Savior. That's the wrath of God. That's the wrath of God. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior today? If not, the wrath of God abides on you. And I don't say that to be mean. I say that because I love you. I would have to hate you to not tell you that truth. 
you need to be saved today, make the day the day of your salvation because you are not guaranteed tomorrow. If you're trusting religion, if you're trusting baptism, if you're trusting in anything that's set apart to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're missing out. You're putting your trust in an act. You're putting your trust in a work. And Jesus said, no, I've already finished the work. Please, please put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen, church? Amen. So let me give you three main points. Well, Tony, that was the first point. No, that's the underlying point. Let me give you three main points. Here's your three main points. Verse, verse, verse 20 says, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. He says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You say, what? You're telling me I can clearly see stuff that's invisible? What are you talking about? No, this is the invisible things of Him are clearly seen. How? By being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Here's your first point that I want you to get. This is that the truth of God is being revealed. The truth of God is being revealed actively, present tense, right now. And He's doing that through His revelation found in creation. God uses His creation to reveal Himself. Now, he uses two different types of revelation. The first one is general revelation. That's creation. The second one is a special revelation called the Word of God. Now, we'll get to that here in just a second. But I want you to see what he says here in verse 20. For the invisible things of him are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. You have better pay attention to creation. You want to understand anything about God. He's already given you an idea. He, he gives you the example right there, in, right there in creation. It's everywhere. You can't escape it. No doubt about it. Now, here's something I want you to get down in your heart, and maybe down on your piece of paper, is that creation reveals who God is. Creation reveals who God is. It's the Word of God introduces us to Him. Creation lets you know that there is a God. The Word of God lets you know who He is. That's how it works. Now, you're in Romans, take your Bible, split it right in half, and you'll go to the Psalms. Go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. We're going to read a few verses here. So Psalm 19, look with me in verse, verse 1. I want to give you just a few moments. I want everybody to see this. This is pretty amazing. So Psalm 19, verse 1. Is everybody there? Say amen. It says, verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. You ever laid at night, back of a truck bed or on a blanket, looked up at the stars? You ever done that? Am I the only one that's cheesy? That does? Okay. Is that not amazing? Man, I used to do that as a little kid. Just look up and go, wow. And I grew up in western Kansas, so there was like no light pollution. There was no lights. It's nothing but the night sky. It was amazing. Just how beautiful. He says, the heavens declare his glory. The firmament de declares his, his handiwork. Just pay attention to just the heavens. Pay attention to the, to the clouds. Pay attention to just how, how creation works. That alone lets you know that there must be a God. There has to be a God. I always felt so tiny trying to count the stars and having to start over again, you know? I always felt so tiny. I, never, I could never count them. I'd always get interrupted or my mind would drift. Listen, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his hand. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Look at this, verse 3. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You know what that tells me? That creation speaks every single language. It speaks Swahili. It speaks, it speaks Urdu. It speaks uh, it, Botswanese. I don't even know what they speak in Botswana. But he speaks that one too. He speaks every single language. You can't go anywhere on this planet. You get this. This is important. You cannot go anywhere on this planet and not see that God exists. I don't care where you go. You will come face to face with the reality God exists. Verse 3 lets you know that you can't go anywhere. But I don't speak creation. doesn't matter. Creation speaks your language. He'll speak to you. Verse 4, 
Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. You can't escape the sun. Well, I got news for you. Study your Bible. The sun is a picture of Jesus Christ himself. And every time the sun rises and every time the sun sets, it's a reminder that he came and he's, he's gone and he's coming again. And you can't escape the heat. His light has lit your soul on fire. He's lit you up. You can't escape it. That's the sun. You can't, so you can't go anywhere on this planet without recognizing and seeing that God exists. You know what that also tells me? That tells me that you can't go anywhere on this planet and not find someone who's witnessed creation. Every person you come in contact with has come face to face with the fact that God exists because they came face to face with his creation. You know what that also tells me? That tells me that I can't go anywhere on the planet and not find someone who doesn't know that God exists. Every person I talk to, every person I meet knows that God exists. Nuh uh, well, I'm an atheist. I don't care. At some point in time, God revealed himself to you through his creation, and you recognize that there is a God. You just choose, chose not to follow him, you chose not to accept it. I don't care what Christopher Hitchens says or said, he's dead. I, I, I don't care what Albert Einstein said. Every single one of those guys believed God existed. They just chose to hold the truth in unrighteousness. That means every person you come in contact with believes in God. Do you understand that? They believe in God. They just might not choose to think that they do. Now we'll get to that here in just a few seconds. But I want you to notice, back over here in Romans, at the end of verse 20, he says that they see the, His eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Isn't that what it says? They see His power, eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. You know what that means to me? When I see that God reveals Himself through His creation, that tells me that no one can ever say that there just wasn't enough evidence. No one could ever say, I just didn't have enough evidence to believe in God. That's what Christopher Hitchens said when they asked him. He said, hey, if you could stand before God. He goes, well, I don't believe he exists. It doesn't matter. If you could stand before God and, 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 and you found out when you got there that he really did exist, what would you say to him? And his, this is what he said. I would, I would tell God that you didn't give me enough evidence. F-O-O-L. You're a fool. You're a fool. Well, guess what happened to Christopher Hitchens? He died. And he busts hell wide open. And one day, he will witness the wrath of God at the great white throne judgment. He will recognize that God is who he said he is. He will bow the knee. He will be found guilty. And he will be cast into a lake of fire. Because he held the truth in unrighteousness. The end of verse 20 lets you know that they are without excuse. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but I don't care. You came face to face with creation. And you chose to acknowledge God. Or you chose to worship creation. It's one or the other. It's literally one or the other. So listen, in Psalm 19, in Psalm 19, look at verse 7. Did you guys leave Psalm 19? Sorry, my fault. I did too. In Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, um, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Did you get that? That the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So here's the teaching. Creation reveals God. 
This book introduces us to him. Doesn't it? So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Right? That lets you know that in your heart of hearts, the very issue that has been ingrained in you since the day you breathe, you breathe your first breath is where did I come from? How did this all get here? That's the question you've been asking yourself since the very, very beginning. And God's got news for you. In the very first verse of his Bible, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. That question you've been asking, that's the question I'm going to answer right off the jump. He could have said anything. He said, there's got to be a guy named Jesus to come and save your soul. That's how he could have started the Bible. He doesn't do that. He said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Hello, I'm the one that did it. All that creation that you've been looking at, everything you've been seeing, and you're wondering, who's out there? Who created it? How did I get here? God's going, hello, that'd be me. I'd be the one. Hello. That's him. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you can't look at creation and, and not see his eternal power. You can't look at creation and not see his eternal Godhead. You can't. It's not possible. It's absolutely not possible. No one can ever say there's not enough evidence. Look what John chapter 1 and verse 9 says. That was the true light which lighted every man that cometh in the world. Capital L, light. You can't escape the rays of the sun. Isn't that what Psalm 19 verse 6 said? You can't escape his rays. No, the light has lit every man that cometh in the world. Check out Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to how many men? Oh. All men. Every person you come in contact with has come face to face with reality that God exists because His light has penetrated their soul and the grace of God has been revealed to them. Don't tell me there's an excuse. You don't have an excuse. There is no excuse. You will witness His eternal power and Godhead. Why? Because people will see God for who He is when you look at creation. So let's pull up Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now let's just, let's just camp out here for just a few moments. Let's just witness His eternal power and His Godhead here for a moment. This is how amazing my God is. This is how amazing your God is. In the beginning, you know what that tells us? There's a definite starting point, doesn't it? That tells you there's a definite starting point. Well, that removes materialism. You know what a materialist says? I've always been. All matter is eternal, therefore I am eternal. Uh, no. No, there's a definite starting point. In the beginning. So in the beginning, what's the next word? God. So in the beginning, God. That's a singular God. That destroys atheism. Atheism says, I, I don't know whether there is a God. No, that's agnosticism. And atheist says there is no God, the absence of God. No, no, no. My Bible says, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, that there is a God. In the beginning, God. It destroys agnosticism where God can't be known. It destroys polytheism where they said there's multiple gods. He says, no, there's one singular God. His name is Elohim. His name is Jehovah. His name is my Savior. So in the beginning, God, then what God do? He created. That means there's a singular moment in time that destroys evolution. You know how they say it, evolution in England? They call it evolution. I love it. I think it's awesome. Evolution. It's evolution. Evolution teaches that. Think about this just for a moment. Here's what evolution teaches. That all things evolve from something else and are traced back to a catastrophic ordering event. Now, when was the last time anything ever exploded and created order? <laughs> the laws of thermodynamics go against that. It's not possible. Confusion never brings order. Things are always going the opposite direction. Order is always going to chaos. Chaos is never going to order. And yet evolution teaches the exact opposite of that. Making no sense to me. Well, well why? Because Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created. Then also, believer, get this. It also destroys theistic evolution. Which means, where some people teach, well, God did create him, but he used evolution to do that. No, it destroys that because he says there's a single moment in time. In the beginning God created it doesn't say through the passage of time. 
No, it doesn't do that. It doesn't say that. In the beginning, God created. You're here because, um, um, so, so God creates all things through an evolutionary process, what a the, the, theistic, I cannot ever say that word, theistic evolutionists would say. But notice the rest of the verse, in the beginning, God created the heaven and what? The earth. That means that God is separate from his creation. That means God is outside of his creation. Doesn't it? That removes pantheism. Pantheism says that God is in all things and God is all things. That God is this pulpit. God is that pew. God is that carpet. God is your eyeglasses. That's foolish. But that's what, that's what a pantheist believes. An existentialist says, no, I, I am who I am because that's who I choose to be. Well, God says the exact opposite. No, you are who you are because that's who I created you to be. So you can't have one or the other. You have to have, you have, to have this. Right? It's in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He's separate from his creation. So think about Let's just run through it again. In the beginning, time. Right? In the beginning, God, force. In the beginning, God created action. In the beginning, God created the heaven, space. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, matter. All five measurables of science found in the very first verse of your entire Bible. It took science a long time to figure it out. And God just dangled it right in your face in the very first verse of the Bible. You want to understand science? You go to the Bible. It's got things figured out real quick. So Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says you, you, you can't come to his creation without seeing his eternal power and his Godhead. His eternal power is His creative act, but His Godhead. Now, here's what the word Godhead means. It means Trinity. It means the triune God. It means God in three persons. It's only mentioned three times in Scripture. Once here in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Once in Acts, I think it's chapter 7, verse 26. And the other one's Colossians chapter 3. Those are the only three mentions of the word Godhead in your entire Bible. Now, here's what's amazing to me. I think about this. Now, God exists outside of His creation. And only God can take and create something from nothing. Only God could do that. One of my favorite jokes is where a scientist says, I'm going to, I'm going to do what God does. And says, God, how about you and me have a competition? Let's, let's create a horse. Okay. God says, I'm down. Let's do this. So the God and the, and the scientists come up and they, they begin to, the debate's getting ready to happen. And everybody's gathered up. They're getting ready to have this big competition. And God says, horse, boom, horse shows up. Scientist says, watch this. And he grabs, reaches down and grabs a bunch of dirt and begins to mold it and shape it. And God says, da, 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 da. get your own dirt. <laughs> get your own dirt. I love that. I love that. Because my God creates something from, from nothing. But science will try to teach you that something comes from nothing. It's just not possible. So how did God create? What did he, what did he use as a design? How did, he, how did he come up with that? He used himself as, as the template. He uses himself as the pattern. Everything in creation breaks down into three. Everything. Space, heaven. How does it, how's it break down? Length, width, and depth. How does time break down? Past, present, future. How does matter break down? Solid, liquid, gas. Everything, you, body, soul, spirit. Everything in creation breaks down into threes. Have fun. That's a fun one. Go enjoy that. That's amazing to me. Everything breaks down into threes. Um, Animal, vegetable, mineral, right? It all breaks down into threes. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Look over here in verse 21. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So, very first point, God is revealing truth. Here's your second point. So, people are rejecting the truth. That's your second point. God, the truth is revealed, first point. Second point, the truth is being rejected. Completely rejected, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, 
They saw God for who He is. They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Listen, what happens when the truth is rejected? People see God for who He is. But then they don't like what they see. That's what he's teaching here in verse 21. People see God for who He is. And they glorified Him not as God, and neither were thankful. They didn't like what they saw. So they refused to give Him glory, refused to give Him thanks. They refused to lay down their pride. And what's the very last part of verse 21 says? And, and became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The light went off. They shut off the light that lit every man, according to John, John chapter 1, verse 9. Their foolish heart was darkened. So people will see God for who He is. They don't like what they see. And see so you know what they do? They invent something else to see. That's what he just said in verse 21. I see God. I'm not going to give Him glory. I'm not going to give Him thanks. And so I'm going to let my vain imaginations do their thing. I'm going to create something else to see. I don't want to see God. Check out this head-scratcher of a quote. Check this thing out. Dr. George Wald, physicist, won the National uh, Nobel Peace Prize in like 1967. What he says, let's see if we agree with him. When it comes to the origin of life, we have only two possibilities as to how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. Would you all agree with that? One of those two options. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation that life arose from non-living matter was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That leaves us with the only possible conclusion that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. Would you all agree with that? Everybody agrees with that. Oh, look what he says. I will not accept that philosophically because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. That's crazy. Say what? I don't want to believe in God. And so I choose my vain imagination to see what I want to see. I love how Mark Trotter puts it. That makes sense if you don't think about it. <laughs> I, I, it just makes no sense to me. It's a head scratcher for me. That's crazy, isn't it? That's nutsoid. Romans chapter 1, verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise... They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed bees and creeping things. Now, Jeff Bartell pointed this out to me a long time ago. What do, was, how does verse 22 start? Professing themselves to be wise. What do you call those that profess? Professors. What that professor have to say? Foolishness, because he thought he was wise. In his own wisdom, in his own wiseness, I have another word for that. I'm not going to say it. He became a fool. Become a fool. Complete foolishness. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Listen, the world refuses to submit to God because they think that they're smarter than him. Look at Psalm 14, verse 1. Right here. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Pretty simple, isn't it? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I see God. I don't want to see God. I want to create something else to see. Fool! You're a fool. You say in your heart that there is no God. When everything in your heart is telling you there is a God. And you're holding the truth and the righteousness. Therefore, the wrath of God is revealed. Now, here's what they do. Verse 23, and we're out. He changed the glory of the uncorruptible into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Point number one, the truth is revealed. Point number two, the truth is rejected. Point number three, the truth is reformed. They take the truth of God and they change it. And they create their own image, their own version of God. You ever said those words? Well, the God that I serve would never fill in the blank. The God that I serve, hold on, don't be a fool. 
You're creating your own version of God. Don't do that. Fools have said in his heart, there is no God. Now, how did God do creation? He used himself as a pattern, right? How do you think man creates their own version of God? By using himself as a pattern. That changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image which God said never to make an image. An image like unto man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Does anybody else see the order here? Is this not evolution in reverse? Now where's man? On top. And so mankind today, I want to be worshipped. Because what other, what other God would I rather serve than me? And here's how this is going to boil down, guys. There's going to be a man who comes to this planet professing himself, professing himself to be God. He's going to be called the Antichrist. He's going to be the man that everybody's been waiting for. He's going to be the ultimate man. And the Bible says there's going to be an image of that man. And every time the music plays, every person on this planet is going to be expected to worship this image of this man. That's where this world is heading to. But you don't have to get to that point. You can worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today. You can cry out and ask Him to save your soul today. We don't need to create our own version of who God is because we don't like to see the God that we see. No, we can choose to submit to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, there are millions, if not billions, of people on this planet where the wrath of God is abiding on their soul. The wrath of God is abiding on them. If they do not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, the Bible says they will suffer the wrath of God. Not because God hates them, but because they chose to reject the truth of God for who He really is. He has to pour out His wrath. But I don't, I don't believe that God would ever do that. That's why He's sending us to tell you the truth today, to save you from that. That's proof that God loves you. It's allowing you to hear this message because, yeah, creation reveals that God exists, but it's the book, it's the word of God that introduces you to him so that you can know him. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says. So every head's bowed, every eye's closed. We don't have time to dilly-dally around. Is there anybody here that says, you know what, I'm not saved. I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've never called on Him. I've never accepted Him as my Savior. I've been trusting in baptism. I've been trusting in religion. I've been trusting in all these different things. I've been having my own image of God. I've been trying to worship myself. I'm tired. I want to serve the living, true God. I, I believe that I'm a sinner. I'm separated from God for all of eternity unless He saves my soul. And I believe that He died for me, he shed His blood for me, He rose again for me. Is there anybody who just raised your hand and said, I would love to talk to somebody? after the service, and share with me how I can know Jesus Christ as my Savior. Anybody? Anybody? Just be honest with yourself, me, and the Lord. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you to the front. I just want to talk to you after the service. Anybody? Since I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know for sure that I'm going to spend eternity with the Lord. Anybody? Don't miss the chance. This is your opportunity to know Christ. This is your opportunity to be saved. Anybody? Okay, believers. Does this, does this message help you understand why Paul is so motivated to get to Rome? He recognizes, understand that there's so many people in Rome that do not know Christ. And he knows that they've come face to face with creation and he knows they hold the truth and unrighteousness and he desperately wants to get there so he can preach the gospel to, so that some might be saved. And if that's true in his life, then that should also be true in mine that I should be so motivated to get to the people that I know do not know Christ. That it should cause me to be prepared. It caused me to understand that, they, that I owe it to them to give them the gospel. Am I willing to see every person on this planet with a big W on their forehead because I understand that the wrath of God is abiding them and I've got to get the gospel to them. 
Let's go to the Lord and ask Him to just deal with our hearts. That we can't live in our own little bubble, separated, say, I'm saved. Too bad you're not. That's a wicked way to live. Let's walk out of here and understand that the wrath of God is abiding on them that hold the truth and righteousness. And it's our job to reveal Jesus Christ to them. It's our duty. It's our responsibility. And maybe you weren't brave enough to raise your hand. Seek me out afterwards. I'll talk to you. I'd love to open the Bible up with you and share with you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jason, will you close us?